those songs we sung, the, the powerful idea that God is the author and creator of all things and that what we offer back to him is already his, but we offer it back as that it is God's. All we have is, is yours. Uh, we give ourselves to him afresh as we come to worship. And the song, The Mighty Fortress is Our God, what an amazing narrative of Scripture that there is evil. There is an evil one. There is a real, tangible violence in our world, but that at one word, it will be felled. It will be knocked over and conquered. That one word, of course, being not an invocation of a statement like a magical spell or a secret code, the word being Jesus. Jesus, the word of God. The word who was with God in the very beginning, the creator of all things, who has again entered into his creation and been assaulted by the violence that we know all too well and did that because he loved us. This is why we come uh, together to worship and thank God because we don't understand and we don't have a grasp on even what is good and, and uh, the right way to run the world as we try to work out our family life and our work world and all these things. But we come to church to acknowledge that there is one who has created this all and has a purpose for it all. I um, came across an article this week that was important to read. Uh, it was who has stopped going to church during the pandemic was the title. <laughs> and I wasn't looking for a list of names, but uh, as you can tell, there are a few people that used to be here that aren't here with us. And again, it's not so much that we notice which people, uh, but that we notice overall the numbers uh, have declined. And I, I did some attendance looking at this week of, of our attendance because we actually were taking good attendance for a, a good time. And uh, before the pandemic, we were moving towards averaging close to 105 people a week uh, for those latter weeks of 2019. And then 2020, of course, came in. And as we got towards March, once March hit, of course, we shut down. And uh, so, again, this Omicron spike has meant that, again, we're, we're, we're lower again in numbers and we pray and trust that as temperatures go up and as the Omicron variant, uh, variant hopefully uh, recedes, that we will be back to where we were uh, earlier. We were coming close to the mid-50s on an average Sunday, so that was, that was really good. But in this article, it just talks about how across America and churches all over, um, that there is a, about a third of Americans who used to be church-going people in 2019 have not engaged with church at all since the pandemic, about a third. And it goes into details, different groups, different age groups, you know, that is impacting differently. Um, but really almost pretty consistently, the, the youngest and the oldest are, are, the, are slightly more likely to not have gone back to church at all. Um, but it's across the board, and so churches all over uh, are experiencing this difficulty. And many churches struggling with how do we do online? Do we do um, in person, you know, only? Do we do online? Do we do what, like what we're doing, recording, and then put, posting it later? Um, we can be in prayer for Pastor Safwat, uh, the Arabic-speaking church has, you know, wrestled with how to do these things. Technology is not Pastor Safwat's strong point. Um, and he's got COVID and his family So today. So they're at home. They're doing Zoom. They're going to do uh, as best they can. But uh, he's well enough to do that. So that's good. Uh, but uh, the, we can be in prayer for them. Uh, of course, our, our Chinese-speaking church, uh, the sister church, uh, New York Chinese Evangelical Free Church, is still at home uh, during this wave, and so they're, they're going with that digital. Uh, Pastor David, our Spanish-speaking uh, sister church, is here in person, but they're trying to do online. They've never, they still haven't done online. They haven't been able to do that technology-wise, so be in prayer for them as he's trying to work on becoming savvy in that way. 
But it's a good time to look at this passage again, and I know I, you've heard me preach on it before if you've been with us for a time. It's, it is a favorite passage. So I'm going to read for us our scripture reading, Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve of what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say, every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, from one body, and each member belong, belongs to all the others. I think I missed a word in there. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. For the gift, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Could you do me a favor? Babe, can you get my reading glasses off my desk in my office? I'm going to need them today. <laughs> Speaking of bodies that are made of parts that sometimes fail us, when I r ride over sometimes on my scooter the cold, I think it affects my contact lens in a way that I just gives me a little blurred vision there. When we uh, come to this passage, again, it may be a familiar one. You may be saying, oh, man, here he goes back to Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on those first two verses. They're beautiful, uh, and we could do a sermon on those again. But um, I want to talk about the reality of us as a body functioning together. Uh, you know, as we talk about what it means to be part of a church body, what it means to be a, a member of the church, whether that's a formal membership like we have where you can sign up and go to a membership class and read our statement of faith and say, okay, this is, I, I buy into the statement of faith. I want to be a member at this church. And then you go through the interview process. And uh, we're going to talk next week about the importance of having a testimony of knowing your understanding of your salvation to become a church member member. Uh, so those are the aspects that bring somebody to formal church membership. But whether it's a formal church membership or it's just you're connected with this church, you're involved with this church, or invested with this church, that's what I'm talking about today is using our, uh, our giftedness uh, to serve the body of Christ. So the, uh, the gifts that God gives, all the gifts that God gives are for us to be building the church body. And again, if you have been to one of the plays that uh, go on in, um, on Broadway, or if you've seen one of these professional uh, 
musicals, on a movie, you've seen the orchestration of many people, whether it's dancing or singing or stomping and clapping, and th that make a spectacle, a, a production, telling a story in a way that's dramatic and compelling. And you're engaged, you're like drawn in, you're like, this is amazing. And the set designers may be good, but without excellent actors, the play doesn't come alive. And the actors may be wonderful, but if the set's falling apart and breaking in the background, you can't pay attention to the actors. The whole thing works together. And this, likewise, is what Paul is referencing when he talks to uh, the disciples of Rome. And he says, these are the ways that we come together uh, because we are uh, one body, this body of Christ. And of course, we say frequently, the church is not the building we meet in, the church is the people who gather. The building we use is a facility, and we may refer to it sometimes as the church, I'll meet you at the church. Uh, but what we mean is that uh, we'll meet you at the building that the church resides in that the church is a part of using. Uh, so yes, this is a part of our ministry uh, strengths that we use and we is one of the resources we have. But the body of Christ are the people doing the work of God. And so that's why Paul always refers to, well, often refers to the church in these terms of living organisms. Even when he speaks of it as a temple, he talks about these living bricks that are put together, built together to be this place of worship for God, that we are literally the bricks of the church, uh, of the temple. But this body of Christ metaphor is one that makes a lot of sense, and again, he extends from verses one and two. Verses one and two do sound like, and they, they, when, we, when I memorize them and when I think about them, they're very individually focused. I urge you, brothers and sisters, each one of us, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your personal bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So when we sing, all I have is yours, this is our true and proper worship. We're offering up ourselves to God. And we frequently use that language when we come to communion, that we, re re we renew our covenant with God, that we are his. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a critical in any age. The truth is there hasn't been a time where it hasn't been important for believers to renew their mind in God and to be faithfully listening and, and, and applying what they're reading in the scripture. It's certainly true in our age where we struggle with uh, the words and messages that come to us from commercialism and from, uh, you know, the difficulties of, um, you know, the, the, what we hear at school and what we hear at work and the messages we receive from others sometimes directed in violence towards us, right? You know, the, the negative things that we uh, can internalize, but also just messages about what is true in our world around us. I think of, uh, I was thinking about Judges, and you know, the book of Judges just is this constant re-theme of saying, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, over and over again. The, there's a story of, uh, immense tragedy and despair and there's somebody who comes along and kind of saves the day but not long later the people go their own way and everyone does what was right in their own eyes. Paul says, listen as believers, we need to renew our minds. Do not conform to the pattern of the world but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then we will be able to test and approve of what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. So it's from that position and attitude that we are to see what God wants for us and see what God has for us, um, to listen to his still, still small voice and, and, and through the word discern what are the things that God has for us. And when I say what does God has for us, I mean what Paul goes into in the next verses. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly of yourselves than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, 
So we in Christ, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. So, as we say, it is individual, but then this reality is God's will for us becomes corporate because our act of worship is expressed amongst a body. And it's certainly true that uh, if you, we all have different parts of our bodies that we may say, man, I I'm really uh, love playing piano. My fingers are skilled at tickling those ivories. We may have others who say, no, I really love thinking about big ideas and, and creating art. And uh, so we have brains that are functioning differently and others are runners and others are, uh, you know, skilled at other things. But all of us are so thankful, especially now, for our immune systems. <laughs> Those silent little invisible microscopic parts of our bodies that respond. Uh, you know, in some sense, as we think about the American church right now and many churches going through COVID and trying, the global church, I'm sure every church in the world is struggling with how do we handle uh, this global pandemic and what's going on and how can we be faithful Christians in this time? In a real sense, this is a time of rest. And you know, during those times, you don't, you're laying in bed and you're feeling feverish and you feel lousy uh, and you don't feel guilty for not getting a lot done, you're, right? Your body is getting a lot done. And you may not feel like you can orchestrate it or you can make it go faster. Maybe you drink orange juice or you, you know, whatever you, you is your favorite herbal tea or whatever is your remedy, but you, you try and give it rest and recuperation. And maybe that's an image for us, uh, an image for me, uh, especially as I need to slow down sometimes and say, this is okay. This is where we're at right now. This is the church at rest and, and we're, we're recuperating and we're trying to figure out what's the next step. But Paul says it's important for us to remember that we belong to one another that we are uh, in it for each other. Um, we also, another difficulty this last season, I guess, I don't remember exactly how many days ago, but we lost uh, Desmond Tutu, passed away. He, he wrote, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure uh, of reality. In South Africa, we say a person is a person through other persons. You are because of others. I wouldn't know how to walk as a human being except that I copied other human beings. I couldn't think as a human being. I couldn't speak as a human being. I couldn't be a human being. We are all made for interconnectedness. We are made to be dependent on one another. And again, I, you know, we jokingly talk to our kids all the time about uh, the human children are the mammals that live with their parents the longest in the, in the world around us, you know. This is true because we are social and interrelated peoples, and God made it that way, and so his church reflects a special version of that. As the people that he's redeemed, the church reflects an interconnectedness, just like your muscles of your arm are all connected. And, and again, Kevin might be able to tell us more detailed uh, truths, uh, but as a weightlifter, you work out muscle groups. You can try and focus on one group or another, but you can't just exercise one muscle. Like, it just doesn't work that way. You have to exercise muscle groups and ligaments together. And if one of those ligaments in your arm is experiencing tennis elbow or, or some uh, pull or a tear, then you don't get to work out that muscle group. And likewise, Paul is saying, listen, you guys, you have a body. You know what it's like to have all these aspects. You've stubbed your toe in the morning and realized that suddenly you, are, can, you can do nothing for five minutes. <laughs> you know, it takes your whole body out because that one toe. <laughs> Likewise, we belong to each other. And again, we talk about this in our membership class. And we use this book uh, called I Am a Church Member. So if you've gone through the membership class, you have this book and you've read this book. 
I know you have because you promised me that you did. Uh, And if you are wanting to read this book, you've been a member for a long time, longer than I've been here, and you want to read this book, let me know. I will give you a copy. You can borrow mine. You can uh, take one. But uh, if you're going to go through the membership class, we'll ask you to read this whole book. It is a very short book and a very easy read, but it talks about being a church member and many of the aspects of it. But in one section I want to just read briefly, he talks about the difference between being a member of a church and being the member of a country club. He says, with a country club membership, you pay others to do work for you. With church membership, everyone has a role or a function. That's why some are hands and feet and ears or eyes. We are all different, but we are necessary parts of the whole. Each part, therefore, has to do its work, or the whole body suffers. There is a beautiful diversity in the midst of unity in church membership. The Bible makes it clear that if one part does not do its job, the whole body does not function well. But if one part does its job, the whole body rejoices and is stronger. And then he quotes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a parallel passage to this passage. He says, So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So we know uh, that we are all frail, we are all uh, human, and Paul begins this passage of membership talking about how we need to start with a position of humility, and we talked about that last week. Uh, So he says, listen, each of you has been portioned faith to be used in the body, and by the grace given to me, he says, the part that I've been given, let me encourage you, by the grace given to me, I say to each one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed with you. Last week we talked about how God gives grace to each differently to be used for his kingdom, Ephesians 4. We have different gifts, jumping down to verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If if the gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encourage. If it is giving, then give generously. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, show mercy cheerfully. So in a sense, we get uh, gifts like the Holy Spirit grab bag. You know, when I was a, a young child, my sister was older enough than me that she was often my babysitter. And one of the ways that she would keep my brother and I from driving her crazy is she had these grab bags that if we were good, then at the end of the night when mom and dad were getting home, uh, she would let us take something out of the grab bag. And at that time, you know, to get a new pencil or a, a, a notebook, you know, a spiral bound notebook. You know, I had no idea that that was like five cents or something in, that, in those days. But um, to me, it was like a sticker book, you know, like amazing, you know, like, and so that was a real incentive. But the reality is the Holy Spirit gift bag, you might look at and say, well, oh, I, I only got hospitality. Uh, the reality is the deepest Uh, word for the church uh, in chapter 12, if we were to go all the way through it, is hospitality. In fact, when we come together in the morning on Sunday, like I'm counting on all of us to exercise hospitality, but I'm dependent on those of you who have the gift of hospitality. It may not be the flashiest gift. You don't get to stand up here in front of a microphone. But I'm counting on those of you who have the gift of hospitality to reach out to people who are coming in for the first time and get to know their name and say hello and say welcome. We're glad you're here. This is critical for our church. If I, if you have the the gift of teaching in, in a Sunday school context, man, I want to applaud you because we need at some point when we're, when we're coming out of this restful state uh, to restart our Sunday school programs. You know, if you have the gift of uh, mercies, man, we are in a 
world that is desperate for people who have the gift of mercy and gentleness. Those kind words, the ability to listen and say, man, I'm with you, that's terrible. The ability to not be judgmental, but to be offering a kind word from the Lord, that is a gift. And we need you in the body because you need to shore up the other members of us who need that amongst us. Some of you have the gift of truth-telling, whether you call it prophecy or, or you call it uh, discernment, whatever you call that gift. Again, there are other gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians, but the point is that they all need to be used in a humble fashion, seeing as Paul will say to the Philippians, don't think of others as less important than yourselves. We all think of each other just as Christ did. So we see this humbly, uh, in a humble manner towards this way that we can use our giftedness to build up other people in the church. As James will say, the brother of Jesus, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift us up. So uh, we want to build in unity. We want to grow in unity in these ways using our gifts. And that's an important aspect of the church. It's a hard aspect of the church. It's a challenging aspect of the church because we're all frail. And when we come together and we use our giftedness, it exposes us to the reality that we are not yet perfectly walking in Christ. So this gives us an opportunity for forgiveness when there's hurt feelings or missed expectations. It gives us an opportunity for truth-telling. We talked last week about speaking the truth in love. Uh, to say, hey, this didn't work out the way I think you intended. Or, you know, when you said this, it didn't come out maybe the way you wanted. And how can we reconcile that? Or, hey, this, uh, I have some hurt feelings over some issues here. Uh, can we talk about those things? This is healthy relationship life. Uh, it's not comfortable always. And it, it's not easy. But the beautiful thing of a smaller church is that we can work hard at doing it well. And I'm not saying big church is bad. I'm just saying the advantage that we have as a small church, and one we should leverage as much as we can because we don't have some of the advantages that a larger church has, uh, we should use that advantage of that personal relational aspect. So I invite you uh, into that. And, and again, as you consider, you know, hey, this is, uh, what can we do? We're in the middle of this pandemic. You know, I want to use my gifts, but, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like I can just jump in and uh, start something new or do something different. Uh, let me encourage us. Let's be thinking about what the immune system would, should be doing during this time of preparation and, and uh, cleaning up and, and, and thinking about the coming time. Are there things that we can be doing in the church that may not be what we do in the church for the next decade, but maybe what we're doing in the church for the next several months or year as we're in this quiet time, uh, this, this time where we're not charging ahead into our community. Uh, maybe we're being open and we're inviting and we're, we're trying to be outreaching, but we're also trying to rebuild uh, the things that, we, that used to come easy to us that now are hard. So it is creative. It is something that's new. And again, each one of us gifted differently. If you're not aware of how you're gifted, uh, that's a great time to talk to some trusted other people, some people in the church and say, hey, I'm not sure exactly where uh, I can be active in the church and, and using my gifts. Um, and we can help you discern those things. And that's usually the best way is have other people come around you and say, well, I see you're good at these things. What, what are your, what are your uh, passions? What excites you? And then we can help you with those things. But it has to be done in that context. I don't think it's divorced from, and again, Paul in the latter part of the chapter we're not going to go into, talks a lot about how this humbleness is going to drive us towards a compassionate love for one, one another that's forgiving, that's always coming back to uh, that humility, uh, that's being honest, uh, but that's being hospitable. It's an openness uh, that is vulnerable. And so... That's because he started with that. You know, with your bodies, with your whole selves, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. I've told you this illustration before because um, I'll never forget it. Uh, my youth pastor preaching on this text 
said, you know, the hardest thing about a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. It's just a vivid illustration I'll never forget. It's so true. We're a living sacrifice, and so it is a, re a repeated uh, choice. It's always easy to recede back and let other people take care of things. It's easy to do that, but uh, how do we come back and say, okay, what's my role? What's my part? How can I be a part of this? Um, so as we think about uh, joining in a church, uh, we remember, just like Paul says, you know, Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. Uh, Thomas Kempis says, we're all frail, and I consider no one more frail than myself. Um, but uh, we acknowledge that God is still, as we sang in that song, he's still the main driver of the narrative. And so even when we look at our situation, whether it's our personal lives or it's a church circumstances or it's our finances, when we get to look at the budget soon uh, and see how that's doing, uh, whatever the case is, we know that God is writing the bigger narrative and he has not forgotten our place in it. He's not lost his page even if we feel like things are out of control and he's asking us to do a part. Uh, to use our gifts and to be connected to his body and then trust him for the work that he wants to do. Let me pray. Lord God, I'm so thankful uh, that you have uh, given us each other to be a part of each other's lives. It's not always easy. Uh, it's easier sometimes to surround ourselves with um, those who would uh, t tell us what we want to hear, uh, those who would act the way uh, we think is fun and cool, or those who would entertain us, Lord. It is easier to be in places where people serve us rather than us be a part of serving each other. But Lord, you've created the church to be a special place of showing us how humanity can come together, displaying the goodness of what you've given us seeing and, and exposing the difficult areas that are evil in our lives, that are uh, still a part of that brokenness that we exhibit, and bringing them again each time to the cross in confession and honesty. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church as we focus in on this idea of how to be a church together. Help us to do a good job, worshiping you, lifting up the name of Jesus, before all who would come to know him and that many would see and be a part of what we are experiencing here and come to that faith in Jesus and enter into his family. We pray these things in your name. Amen.